Hello and welcome to Inclusive Technologies webinar on Insight, a new approach to the assessment of children with complex needs. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. My name is Sandra Thistlethwaite. I'm the Product Development Director at Inclusive Technology. Now this webinar will last approximately one hour, so make yourselves a cup of coffee and get yourselves comfortable. And the purpose of this webinar really is to explain the background and theory of Insight, which is the result of a two-year research and development project. Now this was partly funded by Innovate UK, a government body which awards grants to businesses who can prove the use of new and innovative technologies to meet a need. And it has taken inclusive technology into a, a new exciting direction and we hope to show you a little bit about that today. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, all great products development starts with the needs of the users. And ultimately our users are the same children that you teach in the special schools around the globe. And that's where our research started. So we went to visit lots of special schools around the UK, um, visiting the students and talking with the teachers, therapists and all the professionals around that student, trying to identify the main needs um, of those students, the things that we were still struggling to do, and to see if there was any way we could use these new and innovative innovative technologies to meet those needs. These are just a, a few of the wonderful children that have helped develop this project without which we wouldn't have been able to um, achieve what we have done. And we have developed partnerships with certain schools that were extremely grateful for the um, input into making this project possible. So the students we identified as having the most need were those students of all ages, from 2 to over 20, who had very complex needs. They often had multiple diagnoses or conditions which affected all channels of learning. And when we looked to identify the specific areas of need, there were four main challenges that these students faced. One of which was that most of the students had a significant physical disability, which meant that interacting with their environment or indeed technology was extremely difficult. So we were trying things like switches and touch screens with these students, but even these methods were difficult to use for some of the students or provided quite a limited capacity for moving on. And meeting a lot of these students, we, we learnt that there are a great deal of sensory challenges that these students meet, face. And there was a real difficulty in actually identifying what those sensory um, needs were and difficulties um, in areas of sensory development and looking to accommodate those. And a great deal of the students also had a degree of learning difficulty or intellectual impairment. But what seemed to be the main area of difficulty for teachers was actually identifying what stage of learning each student was at and being able to look in more detail and uh, with more precision at early processing and cognition skills. And virtually all of the students we met were non-verbal and would rely on an alternative form of communication for the rest of their lives. And these students were using some devices like Big Macs and single message communication aids, but these tools were not felt to meet the, <laughs> the whole communication needs of these students. And there was a real struggle moving on from this kind of communication aid two more robust vocabularies. So again, we needed to look at the communication needs of these students.
but our client group also stretches to you guys it's the teachers and the therapists and the clinicians out there who are looking to meet those needs that we want to look at what are the issues that you guys face now a lot of the things that we found out from talking to teachers and therapists um, some of these were brought up in a very recent review the rock review and this was looking at the assessment of pupils working below the standard of national curriculum tests. Um, you could easily insert core standards in there, I would think. This is, is a UK specific um, review of our statutory assessments. However, the issues it raises are, are very much global. Talking to colleagues around the world, we know these are issues everybody is facing. But in summary, some of the key points um, that I felt were extremely relevant with the fact that our statutory assessments we've got at the moment are not deemed fit for purpose. So they're not able to mark attainment and progress in the way we need them to. And actually the recommendation is we stop using those. Um, that does have big implications for national data statistics. So we are now recommending that we don't really collect any kind of national d data on these kind of students. It, uh, the other thing that was quite refreshing to see highlighted is that for students who aren't engaged in su subject specific learning that we should be focusing on areas of cognition and learning. What are the essential processing skills we need before we go on to learn to read and write etc. And an interesting recommendation from this review was the importance of engagement in students. And again, this is something that could be a whole area of debate here. But looking at in terms of engagement behaviours and looking at terms of measuring those. But ultimately, it's down to us guys out there to come up with our own approaches to making these assessments. And that's sort of the situation I think we're, we're all in at this moment in time. And certainly there are some fantastic assessment frameworks out there that people are using and some good practice guidelines. And we did look and we referenced those um, in our development of insight. But what seemed to be a common fact to many of these is that they lacked perhaps the accuracy and the objectivity that we are all craving in terms of assessment. And this is perhaps um, highlighted in this little video here. So this is a, just a little experiment we ran right at the beginning of our research study to sort of um, look at if we gave teachers the right tools, could we improve their ability to judge um, success and, uh, and skills. So this is a very simple activity. You'll see Bailey on the left there um, playing this very simple activity. All, he has, all he's doing is having to look at the screen. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the computer visualization of what's going on. So the white dot represents Bailey's eyes. And the color block, ignore the color and the shape of it, represents um, the object uh, traveling across the screen. Now, we gave one group of teachers, um, we asked them to score the child's skills and their ability to track in this case, um, straight after the student played it while they were observing the student. You can see Jeanette perhaps in the reflection of the computer screen there. And we gave another group of um, teachers this split video. And in this split video, they could see both the student behavior and also the computer visualization. Now, what was um, really interesting to find out from this is that teachers who had that visualization tool were a great deal more accurate with their scoring um, in terms of matching the computer data um, than those who didn't have that visualization tool. So we know that teachers 
and therapists need tools to be able to observe more accurately and more objectively. Now we do have some tools that already give us that kind of visualisation. Even within our own software, um, the eye gaze learning curve, we have things like heat maps and line traces and video playbacks. And they can give us some information on, on our students' skills. However, from my experience and a lot of your experience, I feel, is that actually interpreting those kind of visualization heat maps and such is quite a difficult um, task to do and particularly if you're not trained or an expert in vision or interpretation of these kind of things so the teachers told us there was a need to give more interpretation to help inform their teaching practice and the teachers also reported back that it's all well and good assessing skills, but then what do we do? <laughs> so we need also resources to help develop those skills, if possible. So taking all this um, information into consideration, our insight product is based on the educational theory of individualised learning. And this is where we're aiming to give strategies to guarantee all students' mastery of certain skills. And we do this by being able to adjust the pace to the progression of the learner. And we can do this if we build this into a cyclical framework whereby we look to engage and assess our students. We give the flexibility to allow them to explore and learn along their own paths. We then measure their skills and report on that in a meaningful way. We evaluate those scores and make adjustments accordingly. And finally, we give intelligent suggestions and, and recommendations for scheduling. And this really is insight as an intelligent, individualised learning cycle. This is only made possible by the use of this new and innovative technologies we've been talking about, data analytics and algorithms. Now these may be foreign terms to many of you, but this is really the kind of technology that's helping to transform all of our everyday lives. So this kind of technology is used in things like the supermarket loyalty schemes, whereby they have information on their customers so that they can supply all the things you want to buy in the supermarkets at the right time and they're always available. It's the kind of technology that Amazon uses to deliver your parcel in a couple of hours after clicking on a screen. And it's a kind of technology that um, companies like Netflix use when there's thousands of possible choices that they then help to streamline into something that's personalised more to what you might like. And these are the kind of very powerful technologies that we wanted to bring and help turn this intelligent cycle and help power it. So we've developed ways of collecting data from our students and in measuring it and in then making rules to help interpret it and report on it in a meaningful way. And that's the clever use of the technology that is powering insight. The other technology we need to consider is how we get data from our students. Now we did consider all potential access devices like switches, like touch. The problem is that physical skills always get in the way of any other kind of meaningful interpretation. So that from a, a press of a switch, we can, we can get very little more interpretation of what that might mean for the students' learning skills. So we needed to find 
a method that required no or very little phys physical skills to use. And of course, it needed to be affordable and easy to use in the classroom. It's no use making a research tool when our end clients as such are you guys in the classroom. It needed to be something that's uh, around and about at the moment. And we, you might have guessed so far that the technology that meets these needs is eye gaze technology. And that we are now at a time where it is affordable for classrooms to have it and it is easy enough it's not just pure research tools um, at this point in time but the main point about using eye tracking technology is that it's not being used as we're perhaps used to thinking of it as an access device in order to control the computer but we're using that as our data collection device. We're looking at analyzing eye gaze behaviors. And there's a real good reason for that is because eye tracking technology was basically developed for this purpose. We've been interested in what we look at and how we look at for many, many years. And the fields of psychology, neurology and marketing all use this technology to, to gain insight into our internal processing and thoughts. So this is why we're using um, eye gaze technology for insight, because this is what we're analysing. And what we wanted to also ensure when we developed Insight is that because we don't have full control on the eye tracking technology, that it needs to work with any eye tracker. So it worked with all the assistive eye trackers on the market um, at the moment, all the ones that emulate mouse cursor movement. So basically, if you can move the cursor around on the screen with your eyes, with your eye tracker, then you can use it with Insight. However, we have been working with eye gaze technology with these students for a number of years now and we are aware of the issues um, that are involved with using this technology. One of the main considerations is positioning. So basically the tracker has to see the student's eyes and getting it into the right position can be <laughs> A challenge in some cases as many practitioners will will agree with and the second challenge is looking at the calibration so all eye trackers require calibration at this point in time so that the computer knows where your eyes are looking in relation to a point on screen and for those who are unfamiliar with what calibration looks like you basically get your eyes in position and then you follow dots on screen. And the default sort of setting is usually five dots that move around the screen. And your the computer is basically taking data um, at each of those dot points. And this is important for the computer to know. We've all got very different eyes and, and it needs data on individuals to, to make those kind of important calculations and transfer it to a, a cursor movement. Now, the thing is, a lot of our students struggle with this process, and I think there's a variety of reasons for that. But in a small study that we did um, of four special schools, where we looked at um, all their students um, in this group, we found out that only 7% of those students could, in fact, use eye gaze technology. Uh, <laughs> could use, my apologies, could use the five point calibration. Now we were using another tracker, um, the MyGaze 2, which had other easier calibration options, which we tried with some of the students. So this has a one point calibration. So basically there's a one dot on the screen that the student looks at and data is taken at that dot. Now over half of the students could manage that calibration process. But interestingly enough, a third of the students still struggle with that, but we managed to capture some data from them just looking at the screen, and that's a zero-point calibration. 
and you will see that little slither of three percent of children there was just one or two children where we we really could not um, get them even interested in looking at the screen and again some of you may be familiar with that scenario too so we knew calibration was a really big issue and if we didn't have the accuracy how could we measure um, behaviors in in an accurate way so one of the major um, research and development um, parts of the project was to look at being able to measure skills that were independent of this calibration and quality or the device used if they're all slightly different so this is what we've achieved with insight and this makes a huge difference to the potential number of students who can now use eye gaze technology for this reason i'll go into more detail as we go along so how do we engage and assess well this was all in the design of the activities really um, we naively at the start of the project thought we could measure skills in existing activities um, this however proved um, impossible really because one of the main requirements was that it had to be an assessment tool we had to be able um, to use precise measurements and to do that we needed a standardized framework we needed to use the same sizes the same styles the same colors the same movements and sounds throughout so that we can look at precision measurement so we know what's happening on screen basically and we can determine behaviors from that and we can also repeatedly measure those behaviors however from our early trials and you'll notice from the video of the shapes that it perhaps isn't the most engaging activity if we made something very basic and simple and the same for all students um, that's not how they work so we had to look <laughs> at what engages what in makes students want to look at the screen so we looked at stimuli that our students are particularly drawn to but we know that no one is the same uh, each has their own preference so we had to provide also a wide variety of content to try and meet um, those personal preferences and there are questions about can we put in things like our own content well this would make it very difficult to be used as a more standardized type assessment to do this and we wouldn't be able to put some of the nice engagement qualities like animations and sound effects and things like that with personalized content however we feel the wide content reaches so far in all the feedback we've got a wide variety of student needs and we make them as fun as possible in a game-based design this means that students, hopefully of all levels of learning, can be engaged at some level with the activity. But ultimately, what are we looking to measure? What are we looking to assess? And this, again, was another major element of the research project. What were teachers and therapists wanting to try and measure in their students? So we looked at the things that were around already, the kind of assessment frameworks that were commonly used in, in the schools. There weren't a, a huge number of them um, used throughout, but there were some excellent ones, things like Roots for Learning and the Quest Maps that did look to highlight very specific milestones in cognition. So we looked at the ones available there and the stages in research so far that we know about those early processing and cognition skills. We also wanted to look at the area of communication. And obviously we're looking for some of these students at the areas of pre-verbal communication 
uh, milestones but also looking at what skills are needed in order to use an AAC system because we've talked about these children struggling perhaps to move on from things like single message communication aids. How do we move them on to multi-message ones? What are the skills that are needed there? And of course looking at interaction with a computer. How do we access and learn to control a computer? Now a lot of work has already been done on this stage from inclusive technology. This is sort of um, our area if you like. So we have things like the switch progression roadmap and the eye gaze learning curve that have given us some ideas of the basic skills needed in order to access and interact with a computer. And lastly, but at all, not, not at all leastly, are visual skills. And again, this is an area of development we feel is, from our research and talking to the schools, is very much not looked into enough. Um, and so we wanted to look at what is what are the, the main milestones for vision development and what are the main issues that some of our students might face. On our research, we found out some very fascinating facts and these are not our facts, you'll see the references below. But just to learn that 87% of all learning is through the visual system, that really does pinpoint how important vision is to the learning process. And it's why we decided to tackle that as one of the main areas of development we should look into. And also the fact that so much vision is so important to us, so much of the brain is taken up processing that visual in information. But this will probably have implications for the students we, um, we, we deal with. And there, there, there isn't a lot of research out there, basically, but what the, the studies that are quoted um, come up with these kind of statistics, which you can see there are a large percentage of um, some of our students are at very high risk of having vision difficulties. And indeed, the optometrists go on to say that basically any child with a learning with any level of learning difficulty, very commonly have undiagnosed and untreated vision problems. And we certainly found this appeared to be the case. And now some of us are very fortunate and have, um, have experts at our sides in vision. We have the medics on our teams and we can detail um, a child's difficulties but many people many of the staff in special schools we don't have this kind of um, expertise at hand and children are going by without having vision defects um, identified we then looked at the common features or the crossover points across all these four areas of development to come up with our eight learning goals that you'll see below there. And these learning goals can be divided into two sections, the early vision skills and the early cognition skills, with the ultimate aim that mastery of these skills will enable a student to purposefully or intentionally use a simple multi-message communication device or have the basic skills to start with early numeracy, literacy and other subject specific learning. These two sections are related in that skills developed in the early vision learning goals can then be used or accommodated to develop purposeful interactions on screen and assess early processing skills. So the top level of early learning girls were concerned with the lower visual functions, were looking at the awareness and responses to stimuli, whereas the bottom cognitive learning girls were looking at the higher visual functions, looking at making connections and purposeful control.
In this webinar, we'll only have time to focus on the first four learning goals, the vision learning goals. The cognitive learning goals will be looked at in more detail in a second webinar. So let's have a look at that first one, visual attention. Well, what is it? Well, this is the ability to focus on specific elements in our visual scene. And with Insight, we're looking at our ability to focus on the screen as opposed to anything else in our environment. And this is such an important skill to have in order to register what we're seeing. And there are two types of visual attention. There's the um, bottom up um, or subconscious visual attention. And this is where there's all sorts of background processing going on, but it's not until we bring things into the consciousness that we start to register what we're seeing. And then there's a top-down or conscious processing where we might seek out things to look at. Um, normally, both of these are constantly functioning. Now, you might be aware of these two processes when we're in that kind of daydream mode where we are looking around the scene, but we're completely oblivious to what's going on. And I do this quite frequently on my drive to work. <laughs> and then suddenly we're brought back into the moment and we realise we can't remember what's just gone on and where we've just been or where we've been driving. <laughs> but obviously... Our eyes are still processing information in that background. And visual attention is something that does develop gradually and progressively. So we're interested in it in that um, way. Now, difficulties with visual attention. Now, we have all sorts of senses trying to compete for our attention. We have sounds, smells, our internal um, processes and also our thoughts and imagination. All this is trying to compete for our attention, for our ability to process. And again, it, it's wor well worth bearing in mind in terms of our students that there may be these things going on that are competing and much stronger um, attention focus for some of our students so if they're in pain or in in a discomfort then that obviously will be taking their attention away from any kind of learning task and a lot of our children may have their own internal little world that they're in and again drawing them out of that into visual conscious attention is something that we aim to do and a lot of our children have attentional disorders and this thing about executive control over what gets our attention is something that is problematic but again it's something that develops gradually something to help us rise above our reflexive behaviors and there are children with um, cerebral visual impairment that do have a very specific problem with visual attention. So what do we want to look at in terms of visual attention? Well, Insight analyzes three main behaviors. First of all, the attention to the screen, the total amount of time that the student looks at the screen. This is a really strong indicator of lots of things, including engagement. Reaction time, we want to be we want to know the speed at which the student reacts to stimuli um, appearing on the screen. So we want to measure that, how fast are their reactions to it. And we're interested in if that student has a fleeting attention pattern or is able to sustain their attention for longer um, when they do attend. So these are the three main behaviours we measure. And to show that, I'm going to and show you a, a clip of a wonderful, gorgeous young man called Jesse, who is playing one of the simple um, visual attention activities. Here you go. So 
here you'll see a very simple activity. We've got bold colours and some nice music. And I know you don't know Jesse, but we know he's highly engaged with this activity. He's enjoying it. You'll see a smile now and again. And there's not a lot we do know about Jesse's vision, unfortunately. We're still all trying to learn more about it. We know he has a significant vision difficulty, but exactly what that entails and what um, sense Jesse is making of the visual world, we really don't know. So what can Insight possibly tell us? So let's have a look there, then at what we measure and report on. So the first thing you'll see in his report is a score. And this is a very precise score, as you can see, 37%. Now, this is quite a major achievement. We've never been able to put a specific value like this on a skill such as visual attention. And this is significant in the fact that it is precise and it means that we can measure with accuracy and look to be able to measure progress because of that accuracy. So very significant finding when we found we were able to produce values like this. Now, you might say, but what does that mean? Well, it has some clues in the fact it's a percentage. You know um, whether a score is really good or not so good in terms of a percentage or somewhere in between, like we've got here. But indeed, we need to give you more information on what that means. So we do break down how that score is made up. And there are three parameters to visual attention that we were analysing. So the attention to the screen, we can see, was 23% of the time. His reaction seemed very good. And his quality of attention, again, we get in the green score. We colour code them to give you an immediate kind of feeling or impression. But of course, we give you more factual kind of interpretations of these scores. So from these scores, we know that he has some visual attention skills. He is attending to that screen. And this was for only brief periods, we know that. But the fact that we can measure that is quite significant, particularly in Jesse's case, where teachers and parents feel he's made such good progress in the kind of um, um, behaviours he's showing in keeping his head up and looking at things, that this gives us that tool now to measure to see how much progress and at what pace he's doing that. And so we can see other behaviours, that how he reacted to things quickly. So you could see that his head went down when it stopped. He notices stopping and starting behaviours. And it went up very quickly And when the stimuli started again. And again, this is not just to bear in mind a diagnostic test of whether he's responding to auditory or visual stimulation. But we're interested in how much he wants to attend. The sounds there to help engage him in that activity without it we probably wouldn't engage him very much and also it's to bring that association between the the vision and the stronger auditory sense that might aid memory and perception too however the interesting thing about visual attention is that it's so individual our visual preferences are something that many market researchers would love to know a lot more about. And certainly from our, our children's point of view, that's something um, indeed in need of research. So what we did find out when we sort of let insight loose on schools is that they did want to try things, visual attention activities with lots of different students. And they responded to stimuli in lots of different ways. So I'll just show you a couple of examples here. Um, 
of students the schools were interested in trying it with. So here's Sebastian. <laughs> he was very interested in the more complex um, shapes and um, patterns that were around. <laughs> you can see he is engaged with that as well. And Zia, for example, was very much more engaged with bolder black and white moving patterns. And Trey, again, this is again an interesting, um, perhaps different example. Um, this is not a student we might be typically thinking of using in sight with. But as far as the teachers were concerned, they were very interested in looking at um, Trey's ability to sustain attention and certainly how his processing skills are, because we weren't too sure about his cognitive skills at all. And this is probably the um, longest term um, Trey's sat down for a while. He's quite engaged with that particular pattern. So the variety is there within visual attention to try and engage our students there and promote that interest in screen. Let's have a look at our second um, learning goal, which is about noticing images. Now here we're taking attention and we're looking at it at more selective level. So are we then able to um, direct our attention to specific images on screen? And this we can't do unless we're actually paying attention to the visual modality. And it involves that drawing out into conscious attention um, stimuli um, that we might subconsciously be aware of. And then it involves this ability to direct our gaze towards that stimuli. So it's our awareness and our, our reactions to images as they appear on screen. So we might have problems noticing images on screen if we have visual attention difficulties if we're at risk of a visual field impairment it's well worth looking at this kind of skill and also um, children with difficulties moving their eyes um, as well this can um, sort of highlight some of those issues and here Again, throughout all the learning goals, we're going to measure that attention and reaction to stimuli as it is a good baseline measurement. But here in noticing images, it's the ability to notice and direct our gaze towards the stimulus on screen that we're really interested in. And this is the one that we can analyze independent of calibration. And this is quite important. And this following example hopefully will illustrate that. We're also looking at how accurate you are and if you're able to succeed in a task like that. So let me show you again another interesting video of Bailey, who is a young man I've been certainly um, very interested in following for the past few years. We've been using other eye gaze software with Bailey. He absolutely loves doing the eye gaze games. And we have noticed from things like heat maps that there seems to be a particular problem with using or getting to the tops of the screens and I want to show you this just to illustrate how insight might give us a little bit more information because we're still not quite sure what's going on I'll just warn you as well that I did this is the top level so we're stretching in here as the noticing images so for this game all he has to do is glance at the image and it will pop. And it will give you prompts to try and direct your attention towards it. Oh, and he got it. And he got that one. And pop that one. And then this one again in the top corner seems to be a little bit problematic. 
Is Bailey looking at it no. or not? It's really difficult to tell. Well, his teacher thinks that maybe he didn't notice it, so she's going to give him a little bit of help there. But actually, he's still struggling it, and he didn't manage to pop that one. And there you go. That's the activity for you. You can probably also see that it is a fairly short activity. It doesn't go on for a long time to try and keep um, children's attention there. But what does insight tell us more about Bailey's skills? Well, first of all, are his scores. Now, before, some people in the audience have been quite surprised by that very high score that he achieved there, because he obviously had difficulty with at least a couple of um, the images on screen. But the thing is about this learning goal is that the measurement is about his ability to notice that image and direct his gaze towards it. It's not about being able to target it, although we do measure that with the accuracy score there. So if you look at his ability level, you'll notice that it's at 94%. And that means that gives us a, a fairly high confidence that he was able to notice um, all those images on those screens. Now, what can give us a little bit more information, again, is a breakdown of each of those stimuli and what happened. And again, this is very small for you to read. But you'll see the third line along is the ability measure. And for most of the stimuli you'll see that he gets a pretty high score he gets in the green he has noticed that and he's directed his gaze towards it what you will notice in the the ones he struggled with up at the top left hand corner his accuracy is way down he also wasn't attending perhaps too much to that one and again this one was difficult for him see his very low accuracy and see he wasn't able to actually get that one. Now what does this perhaps suggest, and I'm going to say suggest because this is a one-off assessment, we don't make conclusions from such a short kind of activity, but we were worried about possible visual field impairments, but this suggests it's possibly a calibration or an eye movement difficulty and that has very real implications on how we go on to teach Bailey. Our third learning goal is all about fixation and this again is about developing our attention skills and keeping our eyes steady on a target and this is an important skill if we want to look at further processing and it's all about linking that however long we look at something is the time we have to process it and this is very important when we're wanting to get our children to remember and perceive and be able to recall images and to process them more um, so fixation is a very, very important skill. But it's one that's quite difficult to actually um, achieve because it requires the muscles of the eyes to constantly readjust to keep that gaze steady. But it is something that is a, a typically developing skill that we do develop progressively again. And children with these kind of problems again including those with low visual acuity will have fixation difficulties so let's have a look at what behaviors we try and look at here again attention and reaction as a baseline measurement and here the ability is about that keeping our eyes steady on that target for a set period of time and this is the one, again, that we can measure independent of your calibration, show your ability to fixate. 
course, we're also interested in your accuracy, your ability to complete, and actually how steady you can keep your days. So let's have a look at those, how we might evaluate an, a performance. So I'm going to show you a picture, uh, a video, sorry, of Zia. And Zia's at the very early stages of interaction. And he's playing a very simple activity here. Um, the level one of the activities, um, so it, he only has to look at the egg for half a second in order to crack it and again we can see that perhaps he is quite nicely engaged with this activity and he seems to do pretty well so what again can we find out about Zia well there's his score. So he's doing very, very well at this level of fixation. His ability is at 100%, <laughs> which is the thing we're most interested in. Now, this is the score that you get immediately after an activity. So we will process um, and analyze the results of um, that activity and give you an immediate feedback. We knew that was so important because you need to then make a judgment on what to do next. So if he was really enjoying that activity, you could play it again, you could quit and choose another one, or this is the bit that is the clever part of insight, which is the recommendations. So following several activity plays, and again, we don't recommend following each activity play or after just one, but after, follow, after a few activity plays, we make a recommendation on what we think is the next appropriate step. Now, at first, um, as insight is in its infancy, this will be a, a long or linear progression of learning goals. But as we learn more about our students, this recommendation will become more intelligent. And I will talk to you more about that very shortly. And our fourth early vision learning goal is about tracking. And this is, as you can probably guess, is about following a moving target with our eyes. This is in fact a very complex process and, and the processes are sort of involve many areas of the brain so it's quite a significant skill that many of our students do struggle with and this complex process involves not only noticing or perceiving an image but locating it and mapping it internally then sending a whole set of signals out and then this is all facilitated by a sort of higher level visual processing which allows us to predict uh, movements too. So this is a very complex process so in, in such a way it's, it's interesting for us to have a look at and again it's a developmentally um, progressive um, skill that we acquire. We might have difficulties um, with tracking, again, with visual attention, problems with low visual acuity, if we have visual imp field impairments or specific kind of pursuit problems. And the behaviours we're looking at, particularly in this learning goal, again, the baseline of attention, but the ability um, of our students to follow um, an object on screen in relation to its movements. So we're looking not only at the student's eye movements but at the object's eye movements and in that way we can look at their particular behaviour and their ability to follow a moving object. And this again is the one that's independent of calibration. Again we want to look at the accuracy of our tracking and the smoothness of our pursuit. So now I'm going to show you um, what you might find quite an amusing video <laughs> of Theo playing a, a tracking activity. Story. 
and I like showing this as an example of perhaps how not to do an assessment. <laughs> now dinosaurs are a really engaging um, topic for Theo. He loves talking about them. And then the therapist you can't see on camera, that's me, <laughs> starts talking to him and chatting to him and distracting you know, him. You know, yeah. And he's miming the movements and giving us signs and communicating with us. All the things we love and want to encourage, but perhaps not during an assessment. Um, and you can see how much Theo is moving about there. Oh, look there, he's showing his, <laughs> he's demonstrating his tail there. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking away from the screen quite a lot. So this is, um, yes, a very poor example of how not <laughs> have how to conduct an assessment, um, but actually is quite a, a lovely example of maybe what happens in a lot of real life classroom situations we have a whole host of distractions <laughs> happening um, alongside us playing activities usually but what can we tell from that well it was important that insight could at least measure skills even in those kind of situations so we were able to to measure that um, he had some ability in this area. But you can tell from his attention score, not at 100%, although it was pretty good, reaction, very good, um, that he may not um, be fully on that task. And this consistency score that we also give you, perhaps gives you extra confidence or not to, um, to have in that particular score of that activity. What we also do with Insight is if we find particularly poor calibration quality or, for example, you've, you've moved out of position so much that we will send notifications to let you know that so that you're aware that this is uh, a potential issue. So we have full reports that are available as well in our student records looking at all these aspects I've just talked about and these are available for you to share <clears throat> and we'll talk about that in a minute but other reports um, are also available that show the overall performance across all the learning goals and this can give a really really helpful um, snapshot of a child's pattern of learning and maybe areas of need and areas of capability um, can really stand out there. And we can also look at things like their progression over time, so useful time frame maps over a day, a week, a term, a year to see how performance differs across time for all our learning goals and for overall ability. And we can see all these records with a free app. So this is something that will be available very shortly uh, for you to download. And here you can look at your student records, you can edit them, you can look at the reports um, at any time. You get real-time feedback um, after activity plays too. So this can be a really nice way of you seeing in detail, um, uh, in a convenient way, exactly what um, your student is up to. One of the most exciting things about Insight is that it has been developed as a two-way process. So not only are we able to provide the teacher with information about individual students, but we're also looking to analyse the performance of students across the globe. So looking at large scale analysis, so to help us find out a lot more about how our students first learn to learn. And just to give you a, a, an indication of that from our beta version of Insight that was available for just over a month, over 2,000 schools signed up for that from 37 countries. So already we know there will be large students' populations tuning into Insight and we'll be able to gain a lot of information from the way that they play our activities. 
and this helps us towards our dream of um, this evolving cycle of practice, research and industry that we can learn and have this evolving cycle. So from a development point of view, we can respond and get feedback immediately from practice about how things are going and change the way we make our software or our resources. And our research will also fit into future developments and continue to evolve things like um, Insight and other products along that line. So there's a lot more we need to know about our students. Insight is based on our current theories, but we may well need to adjust those as we learn more information. And Insight is possibly the only um, solution out there that is looking at this wider research issue too. So hopefully I have whetted your appetite about insight and given you some basic background information. Um, obviously a lot of people want to know about pricing. I couldn't fit all the different currencies because there's lots of people from lots of different countries tuning in. So if you go straight to either inclusive website or help kids learn, all the prices are out there and quite well labeled out in your, in your appropriate currency. But basically, it's, it, the pricing is on a yearly subscription basis. Um, and that includes all of the Insight activities, plus the number of student profiles you need for reports. And that can be 1, 5, 10, 15, 20, or unlimited student profiles. And that means you can use um, and get reports from that number of um, profiles you purchase. Now these profiles can be reused, so if you have finished, if you like, with a student, um, you can then reuse that profile for another student. And profiles that were set up in the beta version can be automatically transferred to paid profiles, so you don't need to re-enter all that information, you've got all those activity data saved as well. And at any point you can upgrade for more student profiles at any time. Now this has been a brief introduction, even though it may have lasted a little while, but if there are any specific questions, I'm more than happy for you to contact me at the email address below, and I will try to respond to you as best I can. But I'd just like to say thank you very much for your patience in watching this presentation. There will be more information coming soon in terms of videos, um, more webinars um, brochures to go alongside Insight. So keep your eyes out for those coming soon. Thank you very much and goodbye.